Heavenly Father, we just ask you to watch over us, guide our instruction this morning, help us to give us insight that we might understand your word better. Lord, we also ask that you'd keep Satan at bay from influencing our thoughts, that you would empower our walk, conform us to the image of your Son, that we'd be men and women that would reflect what we're about to hear from this passage putting aside our own personalities and and flaws and recognizing the truth that we have in Christ Jesus. Pray for these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Paul starts off and says, I therefore, a prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling of which you were called. There is a conduct that is consistent with being a Christian. Let me just say that again. There is a conduct that is consistent with being a Christian. In Ephesians chapter 1, verses, well, Ephesians chapter 1, chapter 2, and chapter 3 declares our blessings that we have in Jesus Christ. And chapters 4, 5, and 6 describe our behavior. You notice the similarities in Ephesians chapter 1, or excuse me, chapter 4, verse 1, where it says, I therefore... And not too long ago, we were in the book of Romans. Romans chapter 12 starts off, says, I beseech you, therefore. It's not too hard to look at the passages of of Ephesians chapter 4 where Paul says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God. You're going, wait a minute, that sounds like Romans. Because it is Romans. Paul is laying out biblical truth, and then he's basically saying, I implore you, I beg you, based upon the biblical truth that I've just laid out. He does that to the people at Ephesus. And if you go in your Bibles, put a marker in Ephesians, and go back to Romans chapter 12. He says, I urge you, I urge you, brethren, therefore by the mercies of God. And the mercies of God is Romans chapter 1, all the way through chapter 11. These are the mercies that God has laid out and given to you as Paul has demonstrated the constitution of the Christian life. We're not in Romans, but I'm just going to hit this real quick. That your bodies are to be a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That you, not your neighbor, not the person sitting in front or back, that you may prove what is good and acceptable and the perfect will of God is. So our responsibility from the book of Romans is, hey, I am to to show what is God's perfect will. Not just for me, but right here. Do you know God's will? We should be able to say, yeah. In certain things, I know God's will. And you do too. Because he declares it in his holy word. Now, if I'm going to go buy a brand new truck, and I'm debating whether it's supposed to be red or white, I'm going to ask my wife. Because I cannot find in the Word of God whether I should have a red or white truck. But if I look in passages on sexual immorality, it's right there. It tells me. No. It tells me if I should have more than one God. It tells me. It's pretty clear. It's God's will for my life. Go back to Ephesians. Chapter 4, verse 1. Paul says, I therefore beseech you, I urge you, I beg you to walk worthy of the calling in which you were called. Here in which he's describing this, he uses that metaphor walk that is used throughout the Old Testament. It's used throughout the New Testament by Paul, by John, even by Jesus. They use this phrase so often that I'm going to ask you to turn your Bibles with me and follow along as we look at these different words that are used over and over again of walk. Turn with me to John chapter 12, in which the apostle is recording what Jesus says about walking. So, John chapter 8. John chapter 8, verse 12. Jesus spoke to them again. He says, I am the light of the world, and he who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have light, have have the light of life. Here, Christ is referring to walking as life. John 
Throughout the New Testament and the Old Testament, we'll find this word being used to refer to walk as, as a metaphor. It's a figure of speech. And it's so common and it's used so often that we just take it for granted and we don't even notice it. But what is really the metaphor being used for? Hmm. What is it substituting? It doesn't take us too long to figure that out. You're still in the Gospel of John. Look at chapter 11. Now, verse 9 and 10. Christ is speaking. He says, I am the door, and if anyone enters me, enters by me, he will be saved, and he will go in and out and find pasture. A thief does not come in except to steal. Oops, I'm in the wrong one. I'm in chapter 10. Excuse me, verse, uh, chapter 11, verse 9. And Jesus answered, he said, Are there not 12 hours in the day? And if anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble because he sees the light of this world. But if, it, if one walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. He's referring to how a person lives, how a person walks in daylight. Look at chapter 12, verse 35. Jesus said to him, a little longer the light is with you. Walk while you have light, lest darkness overtake you. He who walks in darkness does not know where he's going. Here again, Jesus is referring to a person's life. And he describes it as a walk. The most basic and common thing that we do in our everyday life. We walk to and fro in our house. We're walking when we're cleaning. We're walking when we work. We're walking when we're studying. Walking is just a natural thing that we do. We think of passages and we just assume that, oh, that's interesting, he walked. When we hear Enoch walked with God, what comes to our mind? Do we really think that Enoch and God were going, do 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 do? They're walking together? <coughs> or are we thinking that Enoch lived a life before God? His whole life. And then he's gone. He's taken up. Psalm chapter 1 says, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly. Here it's in the negative. Blessed is the guy who doesn't walk with bad company. But John uses the word, suppose, about, I'm going to say 37 times, because that's what I found when I'm looking up on my Logos, which is a neat little program and whatnot. But sometimes he uses it in a figurative way, and sometimes he uses it in a literal way. So when John looks out, and he sees Jesus walking on the water, and he says, and Jesus is walking in the water, is he talking literally, or is he talking figuratively? Literally. He's seeing Jesus walk on water, and he's petrified, along with all, everyone else. But John uses the word over and over again, figuratively in his epistle so turn to your epistles first john we'll get back to ephesians in just a moment but take a look at this this is all really part of what we're, we're looking at in first john the epistle verses six and seven he says if if we say that we have fellowship with him and we walk in darkness we lie and we do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses from all sin. It's a lifestyle. In chapter 2, verse 6, he who says he abides in him ought himself also to walk, just as he walked. How did Jesus walk? How did Jesus live? Go to 2 John, or the second epistle, I really should say. No chapters. Look at verse 4. It says, I rejoice greatly when I find some of my children are walking in the truth. Huh. Truth walking. In verse 6, this is love that we walk according to his commandments. And this is the commandment that you have heard from us from the beginning, that you should walk in it. And then his third 
epistle. Verse 3. And I rejoice greatly when brethren came and testified of the truth that is in you, just as you walk in the truth, and no greater love than, I, than uh, joy than to hear that my children walk in the truth. John uses the word to characterize the life of truth that is seen in a person's life. To say, this is how a person lives. You're living right. You're doing what's right. But when Paul uses the word about 32 times throughout the New, the New Testament, Paul never uses it in a literal way. He always uses it in the metaphoric, in a, in a figurative way. Because he's talking about it, going back to Ephesians, he's always talking about that metaphor to mean something else. So if you go back to Ephesians, look at the first time he uses it in the book of Ephesians, in chapter 2, verse 2. And he's talking about what we were. In which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the powers of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. Here the apostle Paul is talking about there is a way of life in which we all lived when we were unsaved. We had a lifestyle, didn't we? Before we knew Jesus Christ. There is a method to our madness. And then in verse 10, same chapter, we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which he prepared for beforehand that we should walk in them huh so in other words after we after god intervened into our life and we were saved by grace we were reminded that we are his creation created for good works and those good works are things in which we should live in should characterize our life and then we come down to chapter 4 verse 1 where paul tells us that we are to walk worthy of the calling which we were called, a way that's to characterize the Christian life. You're still in chapter 4, go to verse 17. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk, in the futility of their mind. In other words, now that you're Christians, make sure that your life is characterized by the traits of Jesus Christ. Once saved doesn't mean just live like you normally did. There should be a transformation. There should be a change because Jesus transformed and changed your life. He died and rose again. He changed you internally. He removed the sin inwardly. Can you see the change outwardly? saying but i'm struggling with sin day day i i know me too what about that ah that's where the apostle paul is coming in and saying our walk should leave tracks so that when we are walking as christians so we are living our life and we take our steps people should look back and go those are the steps of a christian those are the steps of Jesus Christ. Your interaction with people from day in and day out should reflect the character of Jesus Christ, the traits of Jesus Christ in our daily interaction. So let me meddle just a little bit. Uh, spouses, your husbands or your wives, wives, you should be showing Jesus Christ to your husband. Husbands, you should be loving your wives like Christ. And they should, without bumping each other or doing anything, they should be going, you know, I see that. And I'm attracted to one another because I see that more and more in your life as you're growing in Christ. Kids, the same thing. You should be seeing that in your parents. Parents, you should be seeing that in your kids. See those traits. They're not magically going to happen. <coughs> Excuse me. They're not magically going to happen overnight. But they should be happening as we're growing in Christ. So, question. When we're talking about a worthy walk, and that's what Ephesians chapter 4 is really dealing with, 
as Paul is laying out. He is urging the believers. He is begging them. He's not forcing them because he has nothing to force them with. He's just based everything off of how great a situation they have. And now he says, hey, based upon this wonderful truth from chapters 1, chapter 2, and chapter 3, based upon how good you have it, I'm going to urge you to walk worthy. So how do we walk as Christ walked? We've got to balance the beam. I'm going to move this out of the way so you can kind of see this. Hopefully everybody can see this. This wonderful balance beam we got going here. That's sort of off a little bit. But on the balance beam, the word that he says, and we miss this so much because in our language we just see, make sure you walk worthy. And when we think of worthy, what do we think? What comes to our mind? Give me a word picture when you say worthy. Okay, holy. Anything else comes to worthy? What comes to your mind when you hear the word worthy? Value. Money. That's pretty pretty accurate in our day, day and age. But when the Apostle Paul was saying this, he knew exactly the word that he was taught using. He uses a word in the Greek called axios, which basically put a, a word picture in everybody's mind. He's saying, believers, Greeks, I want you to walk axios, walk in balance. And in their mind, they went to the grocery store or the food market. They went to the hardware store, and everything they bought, they bought like in commodities. And there was a balance scale there where you would put the weight on one side, and you'd put how much you wanted on the other side. So if you were going to buy, if you were going to buy cereal, you'd put all your cereal on this side and say, I want a pound of cereal. And the guy would put a weight of one pound on this side. And as soon as the cereal balanced out, he'd go, okay, there you go. And that's how much you bought. If you were going to buy, let's say, nails, 10 pounds of nails, same thing. He put his weight down, it's 10 pounds. That was his scale, so he knew. And if it was off, he'd take one nail off and go, okay, there we go. Now it's balanced. That's what he would look at, and that's what he would, that's what he would do. So everybody got that idea and got that picture. That's how they purchased stuff. So Paul's saying, make sure that you walk the Christian life in balance. And what's the balance? Well, here's what the Apostle Paul says. Now, remember, in chapter 1, make sure that you have the... Chapter 1 is all about the blessings that you have in Jesus Christ. Who are you? What you have in heavenly heavenly blessings that you have. So chapter 1, the Apostle Paul says, this is everything that you have in Christ Jesus. You're adopted. You are chosen. You are sealed. In Christ. In God. You have all these things. So he starts off, he goes, right, this is what you have in chapter 1. If you've never gone through and read this, which I know you have here, go back and read that. If you're ever feeling depressed, you need to read verses 3 through 14. It's one long sentence, but read that and go, wow, this is what God has given to me, and he's given to you. Every believer in Christ has this. And then you get to chapter 2. And chapter 2 starts off and says, hey, this is what you were. But God intervenes, and by the grace of God, God delivers you by grace in Christ, and he's transformed and changed you. You are his perfect work. You're not a mistake. So in chapter 2, we see, oh, all the grace of God. Everything that we have is because of what God has given to us. Not that we've worked or done anything. It's all him. Everything that I have. And then when we get to chapter 3, we find out the mysteries of Christ. All of this stuff that God knew ahead of time, we didn't. They didn't know in the Old Testament. But we find out that God knew that he, God was going to do this miraculous thing where he was going to bring Jews and Gentiles together, and he was going to remove the barrier, and he was going to allow all of us direct access to God. Huh. He was going to take rotten sinners like you and I who had no hope of going to him. And he says, you know what? I'm going to make it so easy that anybody, men and women, children, Jew and Gentile can say, you can come talk to me. I'm going to forgive your sins. 
I'm going to remove your sins. I'm not going to just hold them off to the side, and next time you mess up, and I'm going to bring them all on my back. I'm going to say they are gone. Because I'm God, and I can do that. But someone's got to pay the penalty for those sins. My son is going to pay the penalty for those sins. And he's going to justify you and declare you to be righteous. And I'm going to treat you as if you are righteous before me. So when you stand before God, who is holy, you also are holy. Because you stand in Jesus Christ. So as Paul has laid out all this stuff to them, he's, he's got all these wonderful things that are stated right here in these first three chapters. And now in chapter 4, Paul's saying, I want you to live your life. I want your character traits that you show everyone as you're walking in the world. Remember, you were dead in your trespasses. Said, you were like the world. Now you are alive in Christ Jesus. I want you to balance out all these wonderful things that you have in Christ Jesus. I want your life to reflect the high calling in which you've been called. So when people see you, they see the wonderful blessings that you have in heaven, that they see the grace of God, that they see the mysteries of, of Christ revealed in you. Maybe that's too much for us to, to chew on. But it's not impossible. Let me just go back to chapter 3. Remember, that's Paul's prayer. We talked about that last week. Paul's prayer for us was that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, may be, that you being rooted, grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width, the length, the depth, and the height. To know the love of Christ, which passes all knowledge, that you may be filled with the fullness of God. That's just not just some high prayer. Paul actually believes that the believers can do this, and that you and I can do this. And in fact, as he continues in chapter 4, he says this in verse 12, For the equipping of the saints... For the work of the ministry, for edifying the body of Christ. The church has been given gifts for the equipping of the saints. That's my job is to equip you, to prepare you. Till Verse 13 says, Till we all come to unity of the faith and to the knowledge of the Son of God, to the mature man and woman, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So this idea that this isn't so great that we can't live in balance of it. It's the idea that we can be in balance of it. That we can have the traits of Jesus Christ in our life. So when we come to chapter 4, we run into the unity of Christ. And chapter 4 talks about the unity that we have in Christ. That you and I are supposed to live in such a way in the body of Christ, people here in this room, that we are united in Christ, that we recognize not what divides us, but what unites us. What brings us together? What are the things that keeps, uh, keeps us together? That doesn't mean that there can't be differences, but what keeps us focused on the right path in Christ? Christ. Little things aren't supposed to tear us apart. If I were to tell you next week we want to repaint the room. You know, painting a church will divide a church quicker than anything else. I have no idea why. People are offended if I, we were to paint this baby blue or green or that would be like the end. I don't know why. That, or we don't like green seats. We want all black. Or I don't know. Weird how those things are, isn't it? I'm just thrilled that I don't have to do the painting. Someone does it for us, great. Except for maybe the kids. We don't want the kids to do it. That might be a little bad. We want the things of unity keeping, keeping us together. That's the focus. And the things that we've been given, the equ equipping of the saints, is to bring us to Christ and united. And then we get to chapter 5. Chapter 5. The focus is our love in Christ. We are to walk in love. We are to walk in light. We are to walk in purity. There's a lot of things that Paul is bringing, but the bottom line is we are to be focused on our, our attention towards love because if we don't have love, we're not going to be able to do any of these things. We're not going to be able to 
worry about purity or, or light or anything else because if you don't have love, what do you got? It is love that helps us to be self-sacrificing for one another. And so we are to be united in Christ, have, show our unity in Christ. We're to show love in Christ. I think that's about right. And then lastly, wisdom. The wisdom is, and Paul lays out throughout our relationships, through our work, through the way that we interact with the world. He's going through chapter 6 and dealing with just about every aspect in the life that we live today. You know, how do I deal with my employees? How do I deal with my employer? How do I deal with my kids? How do I deal with my parents? How do I deal with my spouse? How do I deal with one another? You see all these boards on here. These one another's are reminding us. Of, this is how we interact with one another. These are the New Testament commandments, if you want to call them commandments. These are things that we are supposed to do. And they all really stem out of the love that Christ has for us. If we're going to love one another, then we need to encourage, we need to serve, we need to honor, we need to forgive, we need to, and it goes on and on and on towards one another. And if we walk in wisdom, we're looking at opportunities for applying this. And so when all this is said and done, got that right about, get these all on the board, we hope. Ta-da. All right. It should be in balance. And that's the goal is that our Christian character, our, the, tr- the attributes, should balance Christ. And what we're seeing here basically is just this. All Christ. And so what should be seen in the believer's life? The character of Christ. That makes sense? Uh, I think I'm losing some of you maybe. So, what are these? As you and I are leaving footsteps behind, the footsteps that we should be seeing, uh, that people see from us, should be things that, as we read chapters 4, chapter 5, and chapter 6. These are things that are measurable. These are things that people should see in us. For example, if we turn to chapter 5, Verse 1, it says, therefore, be imitators of God, dear children. It's not hard to watch people imitate one another. Any of your kids imitate you? Is it funny? Maybe? Maybe, Is it cute? Is it something where you take a picture and go, oh, look, they're imitating dad. That is so precious. Oh, look, they're imitating mom. Maybe that's good. Maybe that's bad. I don't know. Or they're imitating grandma. I mean, it's, it's one of those things. That's what we're imitating. Imitation is a form of flattery. And, and here it says, imitators of God. Walk in love as Christ also loved us, giving himself for us. So that idea is, hey, what did God give? Most precious thing that he had. We are to be self-sacrificing too. And you skip down to verse 8. You were once in darkness, but now you are in light. In the Lord, walk as children of light. We go to 1 John. Um, we were reminded in chapter 5, there's no, there's no darkness in God. God is all light. We're to walk in light. Because if we're imitating him, we're to be in the light. Verse 15 says then, see that you walk circumspectly or not as fools but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And we're talking about what is God's will for us? Hey, Paul doesn't leave us wondering how we should behave and how we should act. He lays that all out for us. And one of the key things in verse 21, submitting to one another in the fear of the Lord. And he starts off talking about the basic foundation relationships. And he continues through in chapter 6. But let's get back to chapter 4. 
because we want to follow the steps of Christ. With the time I have left, I'm going to go a little bit fast and talk about humility. <clears throat> when we're talking about the footsteps of Christ, we're looking at verse 2, and he says, with all lowliness or with all humility. The Romans and the Greeks really didn't have a word for humility. For them, the idea of someone being hu uh, humble was a disgrace. To characterize or identify somebody as a humble person would be to say that person is a coward. They're not noble. They're a really worthless part of society. When the Christians came on the scene and started talking about humility, that was revolutionary. It's even believed that the Christians coined, possibly even Paul, coined this idea of humility. And yet we see throughout Christ lived and demonstrated humility. Pride promotes disunity, but humility constantly promotes unity. To the Greek and the Roman mindset, the fullness of life leaves no room for humility. And yet we look at Christ as his example in Philippians chapter 2, verses 6 through 8. Christ didn't think it was robbery to take on the form of man. Christ came in not just flesh, but like a bondservant, a slave, a baby. He didn't come as the king of kings. He came as a nobody from basically nowhere. And then when he died, he had to use a borrowed tomb. Humility starts with the, right hum with the right mental attitude. You and I can have and practice and be humble. But it has to start with the right mental attitude in which we look at ourselves and we don't try to ascribe to ourselves that all the great qualities that we think that we have. We look and we say our life and death are to be a service and a sacrifice without regard to our reputation. It's not about what does my life matter and what are people going to think. It is God has given me my life to be used for him. It really matters to him. Am I using the things that he's given to me for his honor and glory? That's humility. Everything else outside of that is becomes pride. Our calling, which, which you were called, starts off with the character of humility. The second is gentleness. And gentleness, or meekness, is often used to describe a domestic animal or a wild animal that has been under control. Perhaps you've ridden horses, or you've seen horses do d demonstrations, or you've seen lions that have been tamed. It is incredible the amount of a power that is able to be controlled and contained. Let me back that up a little bit. How many of you have dogs as pets? How many of you spent the hours and the time to train a dog? A few of you? Good. There's a huge difference between a dog that has been trained and a well-trained dog and a dog that has never had any training. A well-trained dog is a blessing to everybody around. To an untrained dog, they jump up on you. They slobber all over you. They're so controlled. Their tails are wagging. They're so excited. And they are a nuisance to the owner and to the friends who come to visit you. And how often do you hear the owner say, get down, get down, bad dog. That's no, that's bad. And you're smiling saying, yeah, it's okay. And you're thinking, Oh, I got slobber all over me. I got two footprints here, and this is nasty. But I love my friends, and that's the way life is going to be. That's the idea of gentleness is the idea of something that's under control, an emotion that's under control. Moses was called a man who was under control. Now, you might remember Moses, when he first believed that he was the deliverer of Israel, he took and he said, I'm God's man, and he found a guy that was harming a fellow Hebrew, and what did he do with him? Killed the guy and buried him. 
Then it found out and he ran away. Keep that in mind. Then he spent 40 years becoming learning to be a shepherd. And it was described of Moses as being a man under control. Gentle meekness. Lots of power. But it characterized his life as he interacted with people who were constantly whining and complaining. It's too hot. We don't have any food. We don't have any water. You brought us out here to die. We want to go home. Are we there yet? Sounds like going for a ride to Disneyland with your kids, right? So that was kind of like, like, and he's just, kind of, yeah, okay. And then kind of, it was, God, why did you bless me with all these children? No, that's not, but the gentleness idea is just that. When we think of that, we wonder, am I that kind of Christian? Or do I feel like I need to display every one of my instincts, my passions, my motive, my tongue, my desire? Is all that under control? Am I a gen- do I show gentleness? Christ did. That's part of his characteristics. Patience. The third attribute. Patience or long-suffering is that steadfast endurance of suffering or misfortune. It also means a slowness in avenging wrong or a retaliating when hurt. Anger. It seems we have a growing problem of anger in our society, doesn't it? Jim Cece wrote a book entitled Anger, The Worm in My Apple. I love that title. We face anger every day. Road rage, violence in the workplace, unreported domestic abuse, cyberbullying, pointless arguments over anything and everything, school shootings, senseless killing in our uh, inner cities. People are afraid to go to Israel because they hear terrorist bombings. Really? Have you heard how many people were killed last week end in Chicago? Huh. Chicago is more dangerous than Israel ever was. Just depends on where you go. Patience patience, patience recognizes the power of God to change things in God's timing. Patience is a recognizing a slow burn and not giving into it. I do not have to explode. I do not have to let the circumstance that I'm in consume me and get the better of me. I can step back and say, God has this under control. I do not have this under control. God has this worked out. I do not have this worked out. I do not have this worked out for the plans of my kid's life. I do not know what's going on with them. But God will. I do not know what's going on in my workplace. But God does. I do not know. But I'm going to be patient and I'm going to wait upon the Lord. The last one is forbearance. Forbearance or bearing with one another. It involves bearing with one another's weaknesses, not ceasing to love one another's neighbor or friends because of the faults that we see in them. Perhaps often those faults displease us. In other words, it's tolerance. Tolerance for each other. And it's tough to live with quirks of people that kind of annoy us or bother us. But the reality is we all have quirks. We all have things that really bother us. But we've got to learn to let go of some of these things. We've got to be able to put up with some of these things. And forbearance or, or bearing with one another can only be expressed in love. It's because love 
that the Apostle Paul uses here is that self-sacrificing love. It's continuous and it's unconditional. It's that characteristic in which we expect that Christ would show for dealing with people like Peter, who constantly opens his mouth to say, I'll be first one in line, and Jesus knows, no, you're going to be last because you're going to be dodging. I'll be first there at work, Lord, I promise. You're going to sleep in, Peter, because you're lazy. I'm going to, no, Peter. And Maybe you know people like that. Maybe you're one of them. Your intentions are great, but you fail. And maybe you're the person who goes, yeah, i got people around me, and it just drives me crazy. Hmm. Maybe it's time to look at the 12, and you'll find out what kind of men these 12 were. And you get a chance to see Jesus loved them. Even Judas. The traitor. Let me close with this because I'm running late. We want to see the trail of Jesus. Unity requires participation. Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in a bond of peace. That unity... <clears throat> means to make every effort. Unity was made possible by the cross of Christ. It is made effective by the working of the Holy Spirit. And we are responsible in this body to keep the unity, to guard it from within. This unity in which we have, you and I are responsible to protect it and to guard it, even though it's created by God, even though Christ is the one who has established it. We are to guard it from being destroyed in this body. That means you and I, we can destroy the unity that we have. We also have to protect it from without, making sure things from outside do not cause us to lose our unity. But the foundation of unity. Paul starts off, and some say this is a song. Maybe it is. I don't know. But I like the foundation because it refocuses everyone's attention. And he says, there is one body, there is one spirit, there is one where you were called and one hope of your calling. In other words, there is one salvation, there is one Lord, one faith, one faith meaning there is one belief. There is one baptism, he's not talking about water baptism there, he's talking about the spirit baptism in which you were placed into Jesus Christ, Romans 6. And there is one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. We were united by one Lord Jesus Christ. We are vitalized by one Spirit, and we operate under one Father. All that's true. We are one with one another here today. Would you agree with that? But to keep that oneness, you have to be on guard. Because as soon as we're dismissed, that oneness is going to tend to want to fracture and break apart. We have to work at keeping that oneness. We have to walk worthy, brethren, if we're going to stay in balance. As soon as we walk out the door and we walk into the world, we're going to be challenged to maybe not be as lovely as we want, or we should. We may find ourselves not practicing the wisdom and we'll be out of balance. The positional truth will always be the same. This will never change in our life. But your practice, your practice depends on you saying, my faith matters. My faith is important. My faith is real. I want to make sure that I start practicing and I start walking in balance. And those who are in this room are going to be aware of it because they're going to see it. My spouse, my kids, the people that are around me are going to see the difference. And they're going to see the position that I have and they're going to see without a doubt the practice of Christ in my life. Let's pray.
Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you again for um, the truth that we see from the book of Ephesians. That we are called to a high calling in which to walk faithfully before you. That may scare us or and causes us to fall away and think that there's no way that we can do this. But you have given us your Holy Spirit. You've empowered us to live that. But you require upon us to surrender to you and to put into practice. By surrendering, it doesn't mean we just let go and hope that you're going to do something. By surrendering, we mean, Lord, that we are submitting our will to you And it's not our will that wants to be done. It's your will we want to do. And we recognize, Lord, that we need help in that area. Because we so sorely struggle in wanting to do our own things. So, Lord, we ask you to help us to be more willing to serve you. Help us to be men and women of your book. Spending time this summer in your word. Spending time in prayer with you. We pray for these things in Jesus' name. Amen.